good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're thankful for God's mercy and grace upon us this morning to be blessed to be here together this first Sunday of this new year. And while this past year had its challenges, this year we'll have some challenges too. They all do. The one thing that you can count on more than the challenges that you will have in life is the God who will see you through those challenges. We need to be always mindful of that. <clears throat> Tell me of the story of Jesus. And don't just tell it to me in December. Tell me the story of Jesus. Right on my heart. Every word. Stay, let me weep while you whisper. Love paid the ransom for me. Child of God, that ought to send a thrill through your soul like nothing else in this world. Love paid the ransom for me. I recall some years ago sitting in a congregation and hearing a man make the statement that God hated sin so much that he sent Jesus to wipe it out. But now again, as I said in my little writing yesterday, I will assure you that God does hate sin. But I'm going to also assure you this morning that it was not God's hatred of sin that caused him to send his son. It was God's love for the sinner that caused him to send his son. You see, if it was just God's hatred of sin, he could just turn his eyes away from us and just left us there. We need to never <clears throat> lose sight. That love paid the ransom for me. And maybe I'll, I'll get to a text in a minute, maybe, and maybe I won't. <laughs> Love paid the ransom for me. Mm. And see, that statement certainly tells us a great thing about love, but it also tells me something about me. I was in a condition that I needed to be ransomed. And you know something about having a need to be ransomed? Nobody's ever ransomed themselves. Even in, 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 in your stories and your dramas and things, if somebody's kidnapped, they don't ask the person they kidnapped to pay the ransom, do they? They send that demand on somewhere else. You see, we didn't have the price of the ransom. We couldn't meet it. I had good parents. My mom and dad did their very best to live a good life and be good people, to be good neighbors, to be good servants to, of, of God. And you know what? They didn't have the price for that ransom. Several generations of God fearing Christ believing folks in my lineage that I can trace. And all of them together couldn't 
pay that ransom. It all surprised me and humbled me and blessed me last Sunday with a plaque commemorating that by God's grace and mercy, I have been standing in places like this for 50 years now to tell people of his great grace and mercy. Wonderful people. God-loving, God-fearing people. And if I could gather you all together in one place and you were all of one mind and one accord to do it, I'd still have to tell you this morning, all of you combined did not and could not and would never have the price of the ransom Amen. that was paid for me and for you. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Yes. Are you the redeemed of the Lord this morning? Yes. Well, if you are, then I trust that you have a depth of understanding to go with that to realize that if you are the redeemed of the Lord, that first of all, He is the Redeemer. And that secondly of all, you had need of a Redeemer. <coughs> and if He is your Redeemer, then don't be afraid to say so. <coughs> In the past, I've had brothers to try to tell me that that, that that was just being too bold to say that you knew that the Lord was your Redeemer. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go with God's Word here. I know that my Redeemer liveth. And if I know that my Redeemer lives, then I cannot but know that I am one of His redeemed. And if I know that my Redeemer lives, and that I have a Redeemer, and that I stood in need of a Redeemer, and then, then for me to say that I know that my Redeemer lives, for me to declare to you that I am His redeemed, doesn't, doesn't give me one bit of glory. It doesn't give me any honor whatsoever. Because I need it. The Redeemer. I didn't have the strength to do it myself. I didn't have the price. <clears throat> I could not stand up before the God of glory and ever pretend to claim to be worthy to be His. Stay. Let me weep while you whisper, love, pay the ransom for me. As we go into this year, may God again kindle in our hearts a humility, a repentance, a love. We, we, we talk about the sinful condition of this old world. And so much of the time when we do, and when we begin to talk about the things that need to change, and, and we begin to talk about sin, we're looking out there. That it's that sin out there that needs to be dealt with. Child of God, let me tell you something. The sin that I need to face, that I need to confront, and that I need to, 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 to do something about is the sin that dwells in this man. Now, don't misunderstand me. Jesus paid the price for that. Jesus paid the price for that. And because of him, I'm not worried about where I'm going to, to be in eternity. But you see, while I live here, in his kingdom here, I am called upon by the word of God 
to understand and to recognize and to realize that I am still a sinner. That that is condemned in this flesh of mine. That it's a much a part of, 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 of my flesh as the cells that make up my body. <clears throat> the glory to God and praise his holy name. If that shall not confine me or imprison me or keep me from standing before my God, because my Redeemer shed his blood and poured out his love upon me and washed me of all of that sin. But that does not give me cause or room to be self-righteous. That does not give me, the, as I've said to you before, because you, because you may sin differently to what I do, that don't make my sin better. That don't make my sin less. Because before him, the scripture says, if you're guilty of the least point of the law, you're guilty of it all, you see. <laughs> As God's people, we need to lose our self-righteousness. We need to get rid of that holier-than-thou attitude that we carry around with us sometimes when we look at the sins and the lives of others. And we need to pray to God to help us to remember that we are redeemed, that we had need of a Redeemer, that there was a price that was required that we could not pay. And any, anywhere you look, any, anything that's going on in this world, you can say with assurance in your heart that except for the grace of God, that'd be you and me. You see, that's the only thing that sets us apart from the worst person in the world that you can think about, the only thing that sets you apart from them is the grace and the mercy of God that he has caused to have a dwelling place in your heart. So if you're going to brag, you brag about him. If you're going to boast, you boast about him. Don't tell people what you've done. Tell people what God has done for you. Tell people what God is doing in you. Tell some people what God is doing with you. But you make sure that God receives the glory and the praise and the honor. If you want this to be a different year for you, I'm not going to tell you that COVID's going to go away. They tell me they got vaccines for it. We get to see, you know, that that it remains to be seen how effective that's going to be. There's still disease. There's still heartbreak. There's still sorrow. If you want this year to be different for you, then you learn to look to and cleave unto your God more this year than you did last year. <laughs> more in this present day than you did in the days that have passed. Humble yourself before him. Seek his face. Pray. Turn. Remember, this was not something that God spoke to the whole world. This is something that God spoke to his people. If my people. He didn't say if the world. He didn't say if everybody. If my people who are called by my name if my people who are recognized by my mark upon them <coughs> if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways see God said that, that his people were the ones that were guilty of this it was his people 
that that message is to and that that message is for and still for today. If we are his people, then it's on us to humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. You say, well, you know, I, I, I don't cheat people. I ain't going around and stealing from my neighbors and, 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 and I'm not cheating on my wife or my husband and then I haven't killed anybody and I, I haven't even I haven't even spent any time in jail. What wickedness are you talking about? Do you understand that to be able to give God the glory that's due him is wicked in his sight? To fail to honor him in our lives is wicked in his sight. You see, wickedness doesn't have to be some heinous evil. It doesn't have to be against the law. It doesn't have to be in violation of culture. But if it is contrary to what God has told you to do and how he has told you to live, and it's wicked. If my people then will I hear from heaven and will heal their land. Now, as I've told people before, I've said it here more than one time, and I'll say it again because I think it may be repeating. Because sometimes we get this notion in our minds, don't we, that, that the world's going to get to be a better place. That, that we're going to get to the point where there aren't any, any poor people. Nobody's going to, be, going to be looked down on. Nobody's going to be mistreated. There's not going to be any more prejudice. There's not, and, and, and would to God that we might. I mean, it's a worthy goal. But I remind you again that the Word of God says that with the world, it's going to wax worse and worse. Yes. Yes. The world isn't going to get better. But God said to His people, if you will do these things, I will hear from heaven and I will heal your land. I will heal your land. Have you ever had a time in your life whenever you were so distraught and so disturbed and, and, and so, so torn up inside over, over something that was going on in your life that you couldn't think straight, that you couldn't sleep, that you couldn't eat, that you went around with your head bowed in sorrow constantly and tears streaming down your face half of the time and, and you... And you didn't know what to do or how to do or when to do, and you couldn't understand, and you and, and, and you finally came to the point that, that all you could do was fall on your face before God and beg him for his grace and his mercy and his guidance and be like me and I and confess to him I and my fathers have sinned. <clears throat> and then experience the peace and the quiet. Experience him reaching out his hand of love and wiping the tears from your eyes and comforting your heart from one breath to the next. That for all was turmoil and distress in your life one moment, that it was peace and contentment in the very next breath. You see what happened? God healed your life. God healed your land. And if we together turn, he heals my land, and he heals your land, and he heals your neighbor's land, and you see what begins to happen then? You see how that, that among God's people, his grace and his mercy are always sufficient to fulfill every promise that he has ever made to us. That his word is ultimately and absolutely
absolutely true. And his word tells me to let God be true and every man a liar. You see, uh, th this, this has to do with our walking by faith. As I told you before, I'm not, uh, I might not be the brightest bulb in the box, but I'm not stupid. I, I know that things aren't, aren't good out there. I know that there's a lot of wickedness in the world, a lot of evil. I know there are people doing terrible things right this minute. But you know what? There's never been a time in this world that there wasn't somebody out there doing something wicked, something evil, something to hurt somebody else. That's why that our walk of faith is important, you see, because if I don't cling to my faith, then I'm going to let some man come along and tell me a lie that God's not real. I'm going to let some man come along and, 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 and tell me the lie that, that, that God is not in control. I'm going to let somebody come along and tell me the lie that, that, that I can't trust him. Let God be true and every man a liar. If I ever walk in here and tell you that you can't trust the God of heaven and earth, you just show me the door and pray for me while you do it. Let God be true and every man a liar. I had intended to speak to you this morning from the 42nd Psalm. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to try that at this point because the time's almost gone now. But I am going to read the very last verse to show you see, where, where the David was. See, we, we, we're, we're sometimes in a way between two straits, aren't we? David said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? You see, David was making recognition of something here. Things weren't just exactly like David wanted them to be right then. He wasn't, he wasn't in a place of absolute peace and joy. He wasn't in a place of, of perfect contentment. But, but he was inquiring of his soul. I, 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 so many times I, I've thought about David's words in one place where he said that when I couldn't find anybody else to comfort me, I comforted myself in the Lord. See, this is the God that we serve that gives us the strength when we can't find anybody else to do it. We can turn to his word and find comfort there for our sake. I thank God for the fellowship of his people. I thank God that we can sit down together and talk about his goodness and his mercy and his grace and share our life experiences together and share our joys and our sorrows. All of that's wonderful, but you know what? If it comes right down to it and you're left on an island right by yourself, if you've got the word of God committed to you that you can meditate upon it and think about it and rejoice in it, I'm going to tell you that you are still able to find comfort. David was looking for comfort. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. You know, sometimes a little companion kind of <clears throat> smirks at me for talking to myself. Then we were going, I went to work for a graphic arts company one time that uh, in Montgomery, uh, I was a new employee to them, so instead of them sending me out the first day right by myself, they sent one of their regular technicians with me that day. And when we got through, we came back in, and the service manager said, well, is he all right? He said, oh, yeah, he's a technician. He talked to himself all day. <laughs> See, sometimes I, ha I have to explain things to myself. 
You ever, you ever do that? You, be, you ever be working on a project and, 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 you, and, and you're sitting there telling yourself, okay, I got to do this and this has got to go there and this has got to happen. Then. You know, I, it's just the way it is. Don't feel too bad about it. David was talking to himself. Soul, what's wrong with you? Soul, why are you disquieted? Why don't you have any rest? Hope in God. You see, sometimes we have to get ourselves by the, by the nap of the neck, so to speak, don't we? We've got to say to ourselves, don't lose your confidence in God. Don't lose your trust in God. Hope thou in God. And then look at the surety. Even though, even though he was disquieted in that moment and he was saying to himself, you know, what's wrong with you? Get a grip on you. You know better than this. You know God's not left you. You know God's not going to forsake you. Get a grip. <laughs> you, ever, you ever told yourself that? Get a grip. Hope thou in God. For I shall yet praise him. See, in that I see two things in David. I see an acknowledgement that he realized that he wasn't at that place of praise right at that moment like he wanted to be. But because of his experience with God before, my, my brother Reuben Hawks, that y'all heard me talk so much about, I remember Brother Reuben one time making the statement that, that the greatest assurance he had that God was going to do a thing was because he witnessed God doing it before. David had witnessed in his lifetime and time again God bringing him to a place of praise. And so he said to his soul, I shall yet praise him. I might not be able to do it right this minute. I might not feel it right this second. But by his grace and mercy, my soul will cling to him and he will bring me to the place again that I shall praise his name. Who is the health of my countenance? God's what makes me look good. He is the health of my countenance. He is the health of my appearance. I don't ever read that without thinking about my little grandmother one time talking about an old minister of home. He Long gone, I won't call, it wouldn't matter if I called names, you wouldn't know him anyway, but I'm not going to call any names. But he wasn't the most handsome individual you've ever seen. But my goodness, when he started to preach the gospel and the Spirit of God was upon him. And I recall my little Randy making the comment one day on the, home, on the way home from church. <coughs> that to be as ugly as he was, that that was the prettiest man she'd ever seen when he walked up the pulpit and began to preach the gospel. You see, God's the health of our countenance. He changes our whole appearance. He changes our whole attitude toward things. I should yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. I'm thankful that he's your God. I am sure that he is your God. I am thankful and humbled and every day still amazed that he gives me the liberty to claim that he is my God, that he is my Redeemer, that he is my Deliverer, that he is my Savior, that he is the health of my countenance, and that even if I'm in a hard spot right now, I will praise him again because he's not going to leave me there. He will not leave your soul in hell. Let's 
not a subject you hear me talk about a lot, and I'm going to tell you why. Believing that God is a God of all power, that He is a God of grace, that He is a God of election. I'm not going to debate with you whether or not that it's a real physical place. Some people believe it is, some people believe it's not. What I am going to tell you is this. The only hell that God's children need ever be concerned about is what they're going to face right here in this world. If Jesus has died for you and covered your sins, Scripture tells me that he, nothing can pluck you out of his hand. You say, well, preacher, that sounds a whole lot like once saved, always saved. Amen and hallelujah. <laughs> My God does not do things by half measures. He does not do things in a wishy-washy way. Jesus said, no man cometh unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him. There's no other, there's no, you, you can't decide on your own to come to Jesus. The Father's got to draw you. Jesus' words are very plain there. And then the, the other thing that he says that, that's also very plain, and he that cometh to me. Now remember how you get there. The Father's got to draw you. And then but Jesus says, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast down. If the Father has drawn you to me, there is nothing that will ever transpire that will cause me to cast you aside. God's good. And He's good all the time. I know that's become kind of a catchphrase sometimes, but I'm going to tell you, it's the truth. God's good all the time. Even when everything goes, even when I'm like David and my soul's disquieted within me and, and my heart's a little bit cast down, I'm thankful to say that I have come to the point that I can look back over my life and realize that even in those times, God's still good. And the reason that I know he's still good is because his mercy has brought us to every one of the, you say, well, I don't know if God was with me back in those things or not. Did you get to him? <laughs> Have you come out the other side of them? If you have, then I'm going to assure you something. God was with you then. And that should give you great confidence that he is with you now and that he will be with you tomorrow. May God fill this year with his holy presence in the hearts of his people that we might give him praise and honor and glory.